So I'm, I'm going to sort of uh, do a, a very loosely organized talk on a, on a number of related topics, but I'd like to begin by, by just telling you up front what my personal biases are, which has nothing to do with uh, conflict of interest in a commercial <laughs> sense. But So personalized medicine actually is boringly uh, talked about these days. However, it probably will become reality, and I think mainly for economic reasons, and th that's because it's the only way to really get a uh, handle on cost containment. And to do that will require a large number of new tests, tests for, th for things we don't have biomarkers for today. And that's a good reason to do proteomics and microarrays and everything else, is find out what those analytes will be. And I ter personally believe in protein analytes. I, I I grew up in the same lab where Watson and Crick worked, and we worked on proteins. There were this uh, Fred Sanger and these DNA guys, and at, for the last 30 years, those guys have had complete dominance of molecular biology. And it turns out that DNA is a good storage medium, and RNA is a good messenger, and none of it has any functional significance. It's all basically coming down to proteins. So I have a strong protein bias. I th I also think that that clinical laboratory science is really important because that's where the growth is going to be in the technology behind healthcare. I don't think anything can be done about the pharmaceutical discovery process. We've had all the money in the world. It doesn't work any better than it used to. And I'm not so sure what can be done about the medical profession. But uh, <laughs> diagnostics can be improved. And that's, that's the, the, the interest, my particular interest. And I also think that mass spectrometry is going to become a major tool in, in the diagnostics world for a number of reasons that have primarily to do with its, with potential for absolute specificity in detection. And the fact that that, uh, that and its generality may turn out to be really useful. So I, I, let me begin with a slide that I show to the proteomics community because they don't know this. And that is that proteins have been measured for a long time clinically. And in fact, it's done obviously at high throughput all the time by guys like you. They, in, in proteomics, people can occasionally be surprised that there are clinically measured proteins. And that in itself tells you something about proteomics. <laughs> now, the, the difficulty from my perspective about plasma, and, and this, th this, this is a, an interesting slide which attempts to put on a log scale of abundance uh, major proteins which are measured clinically in plasma. And it spans 10 and a half logs of abundance from albumin at the top down to IL-6, for example. And that's much wider dynamic range than any detection technology that we've got that is systematically applicable to all the proteins at once, mass spec, gels, anything like that. And it tells you why it's so difficult to discover new things by actually looking in plasma, and it may, which may not, in fact, at the end be the right thing to do. And it, it's also interesting that uh, at the upper end of the abundant spectrum are the classical plasma proteins, obviously. In the middle are tissue leakage, and at the bottom are things like cytokines. And at every point in this curve, there are clinically interesting proteins. So there's really no reason to be biased against high abundance or low abundance or medium abundance proteins. There's use everywhere. And I'll, I'll also admit that, that this slide is showed by a lot of people at a lot of conferences, it turns out, because even though there's no novel data in this slide whatsoever, in fact, most of these numbers have been known for 20 years, it took a long time to begin to think that there was, in fact, a lot of difference in abundance between proteins. And, and that's, that's another indication of, of how primitive our concepts were in proteomics. The proteomics goes in plasma goes back a long, long way. In fact, uh, in the early 1930s, uh, Svedberg used an ultracentrifuge to find two different fractions. And then Tezelius used electrophoresis and found three things in plasma, alpha, beta, gamma globulins, right? And, and there is a pseudo linear, log linear relationship in the number, increase in the number of things that can be visualized in plasma ever since. And it, it goes up now to many thousands of different things you can see. But when you find out how many proteins those are, that it went through a, a, the 2D gel era uh, around about this period of time. F for 20 years, we had an increase from 40 to 60 proteins you could see on a 2D gel of plasma. Not very rapid progress obviously. And then with the advent of really multidimensional techniques, uh, things exploded. And it's legitimate to believe you can, you, with a lot of fractionation, you can probably legitimately see a thousand proteins in a plasma sample with a huge amount of effort today. And so we, we finally got back on, on, the, on a real increase in, in information with these really multidimensional methods. 
But clearly, we, we, we've been at this business a long time. Now, that was a, a statement of the scientific difficulty. The difficulty about where this field is going is summarized here. This is the number of new protein <coughs> analytes introduced in each of the last 12 or 15 years uh, from the FDA's database of new protein-based clinical tests applicable in plasma. And if you, instead of using a second order fit to that, fit a line to it, it goes through zero right about now. <laughs> and there will never be another diagnostic test introduced for a new, new protein, if you believe this. Now that's obviously counterintuitive, and it can't be true. But uh, so I, I've spent some time asking the FDA what this is due to, and they have they have the obvious response: they don't know, but it's not their fault. <laughs> <laughs> and so we've spent a lot of time trying to figure out what the thing is, what what the reasoning is, and I'll I'll elaborate on that. But but the the answer to this slide is: anybody knows a different answer than I'm going to show, you need to tell me because. Because as far as I know, the answer is zero, which is very startling. Anyway, uh, that, that leads you to wonder, what are the explanations for our conspicuous lack of success in using all the resources in proteomics to find new clinically usable biomarkers in this limited area of, of plasma protein detection? And it could be, for example, that the discovery technologies we've got are not sufficiently powerful. We can't see deep enough into the plasma proteome, can't see enough proteins. And we've been flogging that horse for the last five or six years, uh, mainly to get money from the NIH for mass spectrometers. And the answer is that's actually probably not the major problem. The opposite problem could be that we've actually got too many candidates in a discovery sense, but we're not looking, we're not doing the rigorous verification in populations to find out which ones are actually going to work clinically. And I tend to believe that's much more realistic as, as, a, as a limiting factor. There are a whole series of other biological issues that are also uh, of importance. Looking directly in plasma for the biomarkers may not be the smart thing to do. It may be smarter to look in tissues or in proximal fluids that have a higher relative differential concentration of a biomarker. It could also be that our standard concepts of reference intervals and cutoffs are just way too simplistic to actually work in this field and that what we need is longitudinal data, so we look at for, for excursions from the patient's own normal value, for example. And that clearly is going to require uh, changing medical practice to become a standard procedure, but it's, it's very likely to be the right way to do it. And I'd say that population variance is a concept which is unknown in proteomics. Nobody can do an experiment with enough people, enough samples, to measure what the variation is among people for a given protein analyte. And so we don't start with that information. That's usually gotten way down the pike. But these, these are interesting potential problems. However, they're not all the problems. There are a whole series of other problems I won't go into in detail, but I will say that one subject of interest to me is that I've never seen the word theory and biomarkers used in the same sentence, much less the same paper. And, and that's really interesting. There isn't, you know, there are theories of a lot of things in biology, but what should be a good marker is not one of those things. And if we knew anything about what to expect, how to define the properties of a good protein, how to define any set of circumstances that would allow us to sort of identify these from a list of candidates, that would be really useful. But we need to start thinking about it. I'll also point out that the whole idea of multiplex panels, which is what a lot of people believe is going to be the future of diagnostics, has many interesting pitfalls, which are going to have to be uh, negotiated to get something done. And finally, the, uh, the healthcare system itself is, is a difficult environment in, in which to introduce new technologies at this point. So I'll just summarize for a couple of the first issues there. The, bio discovery, the biomarker discovery process is beset by a number of problems, not the least of which is nobody can agree on what's the best mass spec platform to use to go looking for biomarkers. And, and that's been a major limitation, primarily because different platforms see different sets of proteins in the same sample. And that means you can't actually validate somebody else's published biomarker on your platform always because you can't necessarily even detect that protein. And then there's this huge dynamic range issue, which means you have to fractionate plasma into by, by chromatography or immunoaffinity or various methods into smaller and smaller buckets to see lower and lower abundance proteins. But what that means is that you have to do so many more mass spec runs for that one initial plasma sample that you can't run many samples. 
and that means you can't do the verification. Fortunately, there's some evidence that a few of these platforms are beginning to approach asymptotically something that's stable and useful. I think the more important issue, as I mentioned, is the ins inefficient verification technology and pipeline, which is the part of a, bio dis of a biomarker pipeline just upstream from you guys, from where it could actually be begin to be used. The, the discovery platforms we've got, the shotgun proteomics and, and such platforms, are really inefficient for large sample sets because of this resource issue. The alternative of immunoassays is very difficult because they are so expensive to make and set up and very time consuming to initiate for a new protein target. And that makes them, if you wanted to validate 100 candidate biomarkers, making 100 new sandwich immunoassays that are reliable is a very, very difficult thing to do. And we know that uh, primarily because of the discussions of Werner Zolg, who's at uh, Roche Diagnostics, that it's probably going to take a minimum of 1,500 patient samples to get a good idea of whether any candidate biomarker is real. That's sort of a general number averaged across a bunch of different disease indications. And nobody currently funds that work, not least of which because it's considered it, it's not appropriate for the government, it's not appropriate for the diagnostics industry because it's too speculative, and most importantly, academics are loath to do that generally because it's not the discovery stage. And you're not going to get credited with discovering the biomarker. You're just trying to find out whether somebody else's discovery was nonsense, which it is almost all the time. The attrition rate is so high. So it's difficult to get tenure based on validating somebody else's biomarkers, or that's what they tell me. And that's, that's a major problem. However, there is increased focus now on, on this issue. I'll go up back to the theory of biomarkers uh, later. So we, we're left with a number of important unknowns, and they result in the fact that it's really high risk to try to translate candidate biomarkers into something that's actually going to work clinically. And I have to say, we don't know why the attrition rate is so, so high at this point. It's largely due to the fact that there's variability among individual patients out there in the population, and, and we don't understand how to characterize that very well at this point. Uh, I will say that the, the, the once very popular approach that will simply collect a hell of a lot of data, throw it into some miraculous bioinformatics system, and it will find a not quite comprehensible but maybe reliable way to differentiate disease and normal, that I think is going to completely disappear. There's, there's just no way to make that reproducible enough to get it to work clinically. However, if you can do an experiment like that and identify what it is you were using to differentiate the two groups and then make real assays for those, obviously that's a legitimate thing to do. So it's, I, I think it's legitimate discovery, but it's going to disappear. Uh, I'll, and I won't go into the ugly history of the ovarian cancer test, which sort of started this whole ball rolling. But that has produced so much bad will at the NIH and among the mass spectrometry community that. I would advise nobody ever to publish a paper using that method just because of the fact that you're going you're gonna to get killed someday down the pike. Maybe too strong a statement, but that's my personal view. So I, I think the, the biomarker <coughs> pipeline in terms of what we should be doing boils down to a, a three-stage way of looking at things. Discovery of potential biomarkers is, is not really discovery, in fact. It's, it's identification of candidates at this stage because you don't know whether they're going to turn out to be usable. But there are a lot of methods you can use for that. And it isn't just mass spec-based proteomics, 2D gels. Even this despicable cell day technique can be used to do that, as well as DNA microarrays and other uh, pathway analysis. In fact, if you could guess correctly, you know, that's good enough because all we need to do is guess which out of 20,000 proteins is going to be validatable as a biomarker. And 20,000 is a small number. And I've, I've, I've in fact, have been to meetings where cancer, legitimate cancer research people said we should, we should identify all the candidate cancer biomarkers and exclude them and start looking at the things we know nothing about because it's higher probability that those will work as biomarkers than everything we've ever discovered to date, which is a radical hypothesis, but if the, if the universe is 20,000 things, you know, it's possible to think that way. What, what matters is that you end up with candidates which are identified by sequence, rigorously identified as a specific molecule, and then go into some kind of platform that will allow you to make quantitatively accurate measurements over this 1,500 to 2,000 samples and find out whether a biomarker actually is good. 
you know, whether it has st the statistical properties which will be useful in a clinical sense. And, and from there, once you find out what really works, the obvious uh, approach would be to make immunoassays and put them on the standard immunoassay boxes that exist in, in hospital and large clinical laboratories everywhere and pursue the introduction of new analytes that way. The key thing is that this, this candidate verification validation step in the middle uh, is, is not being done, partly for financial and, and, uh, and intellectual reasons, but partially because there isn't a good technology for doing it. And I would say that that is currently the key capacity limitation in biomarker development. There isn't any facility in the world which is set up to do that on the scale that's required to actually move biomarkers forward. And I'd like to just point out that there are a lot of candidates out there. We did a study in cardiovascular disease and found just under 200 proteins which have some legitimate known realistic connection to cardiovascular disease, but of which have never been looked at together in one system to see if there are panels of them that would work. And in cancer, it's a much larger number from microarray and other studies. There are a large number of proteins you can identify as candidates to go into a verification pipeline without doing any more discovery at all. And 1,200, you know, is 5, 6 percent of the total human proteome. And so th there's a serious question whether we need to knock ourselves doing out doing a lot more discovery, straight discovery. Now, we can, in fact, learn some interesting things by looking at the distribution of these candidates in, in for the candidates for which there is a quantitative immunoassay. And just look at the, the abundance distribution for different sets of proteins. And one of the amusing things about uh, cancer, with not amusing really, but difficult, is that they, are, they peak at a lower abundance level for the known ones than cardiovascular markers, for example. So it's likely to be, for that and for other reasons as well, more challenging to do cancer biomarkers, as I think everybody probably appreciates, than it is things like cardiovascular disease. Now I mentioned the, the issue about the technology platforms, and that's, that's really a stark comparison. So if you look at a, at a biomarker proteomics discovery platform, an LCMS kind of platform like lots of us use, and compare it to the boxes that exist in hospital labs, there's no overlap between the characteristics of these platforms at all. Uh, in discovery proteomics, you're looking at hundreds of proteins. People have actually paid up to $10 million a sample to do those analyses, making 50,000 fractions out of a four liter plasma pool and doing LCMS on all those fractions. It hasn't been done many times, but it's been done, <laughs> been done a few times. And the CVs are, are, are pretty wretched from the point of view of clinical chemistry. It takes a long time. You do a small number of samples. On the, the IVD box, the immunoassay box, you do a small number of proteins, but it's cheap. The CVs are terrific usually. It takes no time at all to do huge numbers of samples. And there's no technology commonality between them at all. So uh, what, what I think is Im important is to look for what's the What's a, a bridging platform in between that is capable of running 1,500 to 2,000 samples in a reasonable way and for which you can make candidate assays in an economical and practical way? So there are two ways you can proceed with that as far as I'm aware. One is by miniaturizing and parallelizing immunoassays, things like the Luminex platform or some of the antibody microarray kinds of things. And we know that immunoassays are really sensitive down to picogram per mil levels. The snag is that if you want to make a really good amino assay, it costs you two to five million bucks to do it per target in the in the in vitro diagnostics industry. That's an FDA approvable assay. You can make an assay much more cheaply, but the reason it's cheaper is that you didn't find out all the interferences and other defects in that assay that are going to potentially be problematical later on. So you have a lower quality assay if you don't spend that money. And there are specificity issues with these less well-developed assays. And the last thing is that multiplexing is, is a huge issue in immunoassays. And I, I think the realistic limit is about 10 analytes that you could multiplex in the same fluid volume by immunoassays in Luminex or these other platforms. And the reason it really turns out to be because if you, if you stick more pairs of antibodies, it takes one pair per target, stick more pairs of antibodies in one fluid volume <coughs> interacting with each other, there's so much crosstalk and interference that it, uh, it prevents you from getting a, a really accurate result. So the alternative is to do something with a different sort of detection methodology, which in this case is mass spectrometry. And so what I'd like to talk to you about are the characteristics of a platform designed to do this kind of large-scale verification work, which is a hybrid between an immunoaffinity approach and a mass spectrometry approach.
And it's one in which we would take a plasma sample, for example, digest that to peptides with trypsin, which has the advantage that it stops all enzymatic activity and leads to a relatively s uh, stable sample version of, a, of the plasma proteome, but it does throw away all the structural information. So we're intending to just quantitate proteins by quantitating the peptides that are derived from those proteins. So there's a specific protein, peptide in a protein, and trypsin reliably cleaves that out. Its molar level is the same as the level of the protein. And if we quantitate the peptide, we'll know the protein abundance. This mass spectrometry gives us potentially absolute analyte specificity, which is a huge advantage. There won't be any question at the end of the measurement about what we actually measured. And those systems can multiplex much larger numbers of analytes, up to the hundreds at this point. And so the, the technology I'll talk a little bit about is called CISCAPA, which ha is an acronym that stands for Stable Isotope Standards and Capture on Antipeptide Antibodies. And it's going to use antibodies to enrich the specific peptides that we want to measure out of a complicated digest, a really, really complicated digest. But we know that we should be able to make specific antibodies to peptides, and that may be able to pull out what we want to look at. And you can envision this as a sandwich assay, but the second antibody is made out of stainless steel. And it's uh, expensive, but general purpose. And so it, it, it's capable of being the universal second antibody. The mass spectrometer people <coughs> kind of like that idea. So the, the schematics of this process would be as follows. We would spike our stable isotope labeled synthetic peptides a version of the peptide we want to measure that includes a stable isotope. So it's chemically identical to the analyte we want to measure, but has a different mass. And the mass spectrometer can differentiate it. Spike that into plasma, digest that with trypsin to peptides. We get a, an ocean of these different peptides. And then use an antibody to capture the peptide that we want, throw away everything else, and then use a mass spectrometer to quantitate the sample-derived peptide and the internal standard at the same time and ratio those two together. So that's basically using the isotope dilution method that's you know, been known forever in small molecule uh, quantitation. Part of the objective of this kind of a strategy is to use as little new technology as possible and use instrumentation that is well known and ha has a stable history in large scale analytical operations. So I'll show you a little bit of proof of concept data around uh, looking at the first few years experience with this technology. First, the, the use of the mass spectrometer to measure peptides, because the triple quad mass spectrometers have been used forever to look at small molecules, but only recently to quantitate peptides. We did that with work with Christy Hunter at Applied Biosystems. A little bit on the production of these stable isotope labeled peptide standards, and then talk about the, uh, the enrichment of the target peptides, which is mainly a collaboration with Terry Pearson and the guys at the Proteomics Center at University of Victoria over the water from you up here and also magnetic beadwork with Mandy Polovich and her group at uh, Fred Hutch. So to start with, with the detector end of this kind of technique, which is basically using a mass spectrometer as a quantitative detector instead of, of an immunoassay, as I've said. The, the, the value of this is that we don't actually have to have our hands on the protein or anything. We just need the sequence. And we can digest that sequence in silico to see what peptides would be de generated by trips and choose the ones of about the right length use a whole bunch of other features that we, we like prolines because that makes them immunogenic. We don't like cysteines, methionines, and tryptophans because they're potentially modifiable <laughs> oxidation, etc. We don't want any post-translational modifications because they would be variable. We don't want any coding SNPs in this peptide if we can avoid it. We want it to be unique to the protein so we're not measuring more than one thing. All those things can be done informatically in a reasonable way. And then we would like to use some experimental data about which peptides ionize the best and give the best signal in a mass spectrometer, for example. And from this, we can calculate the mass of the peptide, obviously, and we can project the mass of some of the likely fragments of that peptide in an MSMS experiment. And that gives us a, a candidate assay, the, num the two numbers to tune a mass spectrometer to detect this peptide relatively easily. The kind of mass spectrometer used to do the detection is a triple quadrupole, which is basically used for quantitation. It's completely different from the mass spectrometers used in proteomics research. So almost none of the early mass spectrometric uh, approaches to biomarker detection involved this kind of mass spectrometer. But this is really straightforwardly aimed at quantitating something you know already, and which is the objective here. And the idea in this kind of mass spec, a triple quad, is that you have a mass, you, you ionize your peptide molecules flying through a vacuum, 
They go through a first mass filter, which throws away everything except a little window around the mass you know the peptide must have. Then you collide it with some gas atoms, bust it into pieces, and then you have a second mass filter set to pass only one of the pieces that's diagnostic for, the, for that particular peptide. And what comes out is a signal. And so that signal goes up and down during a chromatogram of these peptides flowing through, and you get a peak. And the area of the peak is related to the amount of that peptide that was present. And, and I, I hesitate to say this with Jimmy in the audience, but the strength of this technique is that it doesn't involve any bioinformatics downstream of the analysis. All the bioinformatics is in the design of the assay, and it's peak integration in the most simplistic possible sense at the end of the day to get the quantity. And for me, that's an advantage, but other people can feel differently about, <coughs> about bioinformatics. So what it really looks like when you do an assay like this is in the second uh, box here, you set a pass window around the mass of the peptide, that peptide is then fragmented into a bunch of pieces shown in the spectrum at the bottom. You set a little window around the fragment you want to look at. And what gets through those two windows in succession is what's shown in the top panel there, which is during a chromatogram, you get one peak. And that peak is the peptide that you are intending to detect. And in fact, you can prove chemically that that's exactly what it is and it's not anything else. And that's the, the basis of this prospect of uh, a complete analyte uh, specificity. This is a particular peptide from alpha-1 acid glycoprotein, which is an acute phase reactant and an interesting protein to measure. And if you measure the amount of that peptide, it's a, it's a good clinical, it's, it's a valid measure of the amount of that protein and, and a useful clinical marker. So, so far, without fractionating any, doing any fractionation of the plasma, just digesting a sample of, of straight human plasma, you can do these, what are called Selected rea Reaction Monitoring, or SRM assays, or the plural is MRM assays, in a triple quad mass spec for about 50 of the most abundant proteins without doing anything else. You just are going to stick in the standard peptide, digest it, go ahead and, and measure them by injecting a sample into an LCMS system. And the proteins you can measure is a pretty nice bunch of proteins. And it includes, I was just talking about lipoproteins today, A1, A2, A4, B100, C1, C3, and APOE which is an interesting bunch of lipoproteins and, and a whole bunch of interesting other things as well. A lot of the coagulation pieces you can measure this way in one shot. And all these can be measured in one run. So you can measure these and, in fact, many other things simultaneously in, in a sample without doing any more work than it took to measure the first one. There's no incremental cost or effort to measuring all of them at the same time in this kind of a system. If you do that, and this was the work that we did with Christy Hunter, and, and run a series of experiments. A, B, C, D, and E are, are each experiments involving 10 replicate runs of the same sample. And we were just looking, and this is within run CVs with the same sample. And the CVs for many of these measurements can be quite low, can be down between 2 and 5% for many of the peptides. It seems to be peptide idiosyncratic, but there are peptides that are very good. In fact, what we, we like to believe that within every bad protein, there's a good peptide somewhere. And the idea is to find them. Now, the, the other interesting thing about that is that the actual, the amount of sample <coughs> injected into the system to make these measurements of these peptides is the digest that you would get from 10 nanoliters of plasma. So that's, that's not a problem, even for pediatric samples, obviously. 10 nanoliters is, is a small sample consumption to do that amount of analytical work. Now, it's going to take more to look for lower abundance proteins. But for the top 50, it's, it's an absolute dead cinch that's not going to require a sample. And that's extremely important from the point of view of what I want to do, which is to get access to the large sample sets that have been collected from large clinical and disease trials over the years. And those people are very jealous of their samples, and they won't give you much. But they'll certainly give you 10 microliters, for example. They can't even measure 10 nanoliters, so it's better to be asked for, able to ask for. 10 microliters. Now, some obvious things you can do. For example, you can use this technology like the is embodied in the, the Agilent Mars column to subtract the highest abundance proteins in plasma and look at everything else. And when you do that, if you subtract the six most abundant proteins, which represent about 85% of the total mass by weight, what you get is, in an assays like this, you get a five to nine-fold <laughs> improvement in the signal to noise with which you can detect these analytes. And so it, it's exactly what you'd expect. That's the ratio you'd expect from 85% depletion. The only problem with that is that 
when you, when you do this kind of depletion, you're not absolutely certain that you're not removing some of your analyte. You're pulling out, with a good antibody, you can pull out pretty much what you aim to deplete. But it would be much nicer to be able to do this without that. And I'll, I'll return to that later. Now, on the subject of how you make these stable isotope internal standard peptides, you can do it by chemical synthesis. This has been done. It's obviously easy to get peptide synthesis done. Sigma will, for 400, 500 bucks, sell you a stable isotope labeled peptide, which is poorly quantitated and not very pure, but they'll sell it to you. But we looked at an alternative way to do it because of the attraction and because, you know, molecular biology is just so cool. So we, we took uh, 30, the peptides we were using to measure 30 individual plasma proteins, took those triptych peptides, concatenated their sequence together into a long novel protein sequence, generated a gene, got it expressed in this case in a, in a linked transcription translation uh, in vitro system with uh, labeled amino acids. And you can make N15, C13 labeled uh, standards this way very expeditiously. And then trypsin is going to cleave it into all the individual standards just like they were chemically made. The advantage of this actually is what it saves you is the amino acid analysis cost on 30 separate peptides and the losses that you'd experience trying to recover those out of a vial. And in this case, you quantitate the protein once and you get equimolar generation of all of these peptides. There has been a lot of questioning about whether you get equimolar peptides released from the digestion of this. And it turns out that it, it actually does work very well primarily because you design the cleavage sites in the recombinant protein to be easily cleaved. So you can fix anything that's wrong. And you can use that to, for example, here's a, the concatamers at the top, fibrinogens at the bottom. You digest them both, and you get the two signals, which you can ratio to do quantitation. And uh, when you do that for a series of proteins using these standards and, and replicate that over extensive series of, of, uh, of runs, you get reproducible data in terms of the quantitation. You do the ratio quantitation between the isotopic standard and the, the protein you're trying to measure over at least a couple logs. And most recently, we've, we've generated a series of additional proteins like this that cover uh, about almost 60 of the top abundance plasma proteins. And the more interesting thing here is covering the immunoglobulins because it's very difficult to find sequences that, that are specific to each of the classes and chain types of immunoglobulins. But that appears to work pretty well. So making those standards is a reasonable thing to do. People are beginning to discuss commercializing those for large, for sets of proteins that everybody wants to measure. And the beginning ones there are the high abundance plasma proteins. Because there is clinical measurement of high abundance plasma proteins, usually by nephilometry at this point. And this, this could uh, supplement that. But the most important thing about this approach is, is, is enriching the specific peptides that you want to measure away from this ocean of other nonspecific peptides that you don't want to measure in a plasma digest. Now, an, an antibody ought to be able to do this. And it turns out, probably not coincidentally, that an antibody can recognize the sequence of a five to eight amino acid stretch of a peptide. It also is sort of coincidental that five to eight amino acids is the length a peptide has to be to be unique in the human proteome. The immune system having obviously been designed specifically to be able to do that. And, and it, it obviously works. And so it, it should be possible for us to make antibodies that are almost specific to a given peptide sequence. So in the initial experiments, we, we chose four peptides from IL-6, hemopexin, alpha-1 antichymotrypsin, and TNF-alpha. And we made peptide immunogens, uh, immunized rabbits to get polyclonal antisera, affinity purified those on the, on the peptide antigens, and then looked at their cross-reactivities. And it turns out that they're, they're pretty specific among the four. So if you looked at the four antibodies against these four peptides, obviously the, the, peptide is bi the antibody is binding what peptide it should. And in, in the more realistic and interesting experiment, if you do that capture out of plasma, with this is showing two of those particular peptides, you get a, a huge enrichment of the peptide that you want. So on the left-hand side there, all the, little, all the different colors of those peaks are the signals for different peptides. So this is about 130 different peptides we're monitoring in the course of, a, of an LC run of a human plasma digest. And uh, albumin is still way off scale there. In fact, it's about 100x off scale. So if you, if you zoomed that down 100-fold, you'd see the top one on the right 
which shows this, this big blue peak, and that's the albumin peak, because albumin is so monstrously abundant in plasma. And all the other peaks are, are very small. But if you do, if you capture on the antibody to the, to the hemopexin peptide, for example, and throw away everything else, wash, and elute the peptide that was bound to the antibody, you get this, this black peak coming up, which was uh, undetectable in the whole digest. And the albumin peak is suppressed to a very low level, giving you about a 400-fold enrichment. You can do about 10 times better with a different antipeptide antibody, the one to alpha-1 antichymotrypsin. And the, so the enrichment on the order of a thousand-fold is an achievable thing to get. And that turns out to be about the level of enrichment that we need to extend the, the sensitivity of these assays down into the region around a nanogram per mil protein, which is where we need to go to be able to, to compete with and replace for verification purposes, uh, the standard amino assays. We've, we've gone on to, uh, that work was done with little 10 nanoliter affinity columns where the antibodies were mobilized on poros and we'd pump the sample over them, wash, and then elute with acid into the mass spectrometer system. To get higher throughput, we switched over to using a magnetic bead approach in which the antibodies are, are captured by uh, protein G-coded magnetic beads in this case. and, uh, and pulled out, washed, et cetera, and the elution is then done to, uh, to elute the peptide into the LCMS system. And this is uh, amenable to generating sort of a kit-based approach in which the kit consists of the antibody and the labeled peptide, and then you just work up a digest and, and add those reagents, add some magnetic beads, go through the process, and you generate a peptide which is quantitatable for a low abundance analyte. And that, I think, is, is the, the approach that we're we're likely to follow, at least for the first generation of these assays, when we're trying to work out a way to, to distribute them. And this works uh, e extremely well, the magnetic bead approach, and will simplify that complicated chromatogram at the top down to effectively just the one peptide that we want to measure at the bottom. So it's not, I won't say that it's absolutely pure the target peptide recovered from the antibody, but it's so highly enriched that it's difficult to detect anything else of the things we go looking for. And we can multiplex this by adding different antibodies together. And in this case, we captured four different peptides on four different antibodies out of a plasma digest. Wha wha how far the multiplexing can go, whether you can go to 100, I, I have to say we don't know yet. It may take different runs. One of the things we've been interested in is how to do the magnetic bead manipulation effectively. And I show this because I just really like it. This is a, this is a 100 micron ID capillary. And under it is rotating a disk with little magnets on it. And as it rotates by it, those beads are swept back and forth in that little tube in a way that, that wa it traps them. So you, you, can lo you can aspirate through regular auto sampler, magnetic bead suspension. They get trapped in the zone of this, in this little tube. They get moved back and forth. They're washed very effectively. And then you can elute them in a capillary tube. So it's, it's, it's part of the LCMS capillary system and therefore avoids any losses of material downstream, which is a major issue with small amounts of peptides. And using this system, we've been able to elute the peptide completely from the magnetic beads in one microliter of the flowing fluid stream going by, and that's, which is really a pretty space-conserving way to do this. And it's a, a very attractive uh, little gadget approach. The capillary, in fact, is a loop that basically replaces the sample loop, the injection loop, on the LCMS system. And that gives us some hope of, of being able to, to make a semi-automatable system that can just slurp these things up, wash the beads, inject, slurp, wash them up, et, uh, et cetera, and go on. Now, making the antibodies has turned out to be a really interesting exercise because we don't know how to predict, we don't know very well how to predict which peptides are going to ionize well and therefore give good signals, but we especially don't know how to predict which peptides are going to generate good antibodies, which will be immunogenic in a rabbit. Only the rabbit knows, <laughs> turns out. We, we don't know. And people have published a million papers on predicting antigenicity, and apparently none of these algorithms work at all. So we just decided to forget about it. And so we, we choose five peptides, because the, the success rate going in pretty much blindly is approximating 50% of getting an antibody to a peptide. And so we, we choose five, synthesize the five peptides, conjugate them to KLH as an immunizing carrier, inject the cocktail of five peptides into the rabbits, two rabbits, and then continue to immunize them for a few months to begin to get titers of what the, how much antibody is being produced to each of those peptides. Then we generally choose two, the best two, 
And so far, there have always been two good ones uh, chosen this way for each of the targets. We were choosing five of these peptides from the same protein target. And then we can go on to affinity purify them and qualify them in assays. We're also, since we're working with this company, Epitomics, in, um, in San Francisco, who have the capability to make rabbit monoclonal antibodies, we freeze the spleen cells from the rabbit that was, gave the highest titer antibody response and use, thaw that out later to do fusions and make rabbit monoclonals which are then screened uh, to find us the best clones. And the way we've been doing that is by uh, uh, surface plasmon resonance on a BIACOR device, which turns out to be interesting because you c we, we have uh, immobilized on the target a capture antibody, which is against rabbit Ig. This captures out of the tissue culture supernatant from the monoclonal process the rabbit Ig, and then on top of that we bind the peptide out of solution. And the peptide is so small in terms of its molecular weight relative to a protein that it gives quite a small uh, surface plasmon resonance signal, but nevertheless enough to actually measure its association and dissociation characteristics. Because what we want are to select very high affinity antibodies for this application. And so th these are some of the traces of the, uh, of the association and dissociation of the, of different, of the pept single peptide from all these different clones of antibodies. And if I can point here. So this one, the little green line here, is almost imperceptibly decreasing over time, which means it's not dissociating fast. It has a very slow off rate. And that's what we want, because we want to <coughs> capture the peptide, be able to wash as long as we want, and the peptide not come off the antibody. Others, for example, the ones at the top, definitely go down faster. And that's symptomatic. Of, that's, that can be measured as a, as a faster off rate. So what you end up with are the association and dissociation constants. And you make the ratio between those, and you get the KD. And so we can rank all of the monoclonal clones based on the actual kinetic constants that we want. And so far, for all the peptides that we've made monoclonals to, we can get clones, some clone, with at least nanomolar affinity. So it's at least 10 to the 9, and sometimes up to 10 to the 11 affinity, which is, which is kind of amazing to me. I didn't think an a antigen as small as a peptide would give us that kind of affinity, but it turns out to, to work relatively well. And what that means is that that uh, we should be able, in the general case, to add three logs of sensitivity to the, to the mass spectrometer capability alone. Now, the, as I mentioned, you can see proteins down to about the microgram per mil level in plasma by just mass spectrometric MRM measurements in a digest without much fractionation at all. To go farther down, we can get another three or three and a half logs by the capture on the antipeptide antibodies, enriching the peptide we want, or the peptides we want with different antibodies, and look at those specifically. There's still two logs at the bottom compared to the very best immunoassays that we're missing, and that's a function of how many molecules of analyte there are in a 10 microliter sample, which is what we're scaling everything to, 10 microliters of plasma. And the mass spectrometers themselves lack about two orders of absolute sensitivity at the bottom end there. Now, in the next couple of years, we know we'll get one more order of magnitude. And if we, got, we went to using a 100 microliter plasma sample, we could get the other order of magnitude. So I think we're definitely within the range of, of getting to that sensitivity. And therefore, uh, in, in a finite period of time, we'll get to, the, to bridging the entire spectrum of, of, of sensitivities that are required to compete with all the existing immunoassays, which is an objective here for a reason I will mention in a moment. And that is the, the question of whether we should, we should look at abandoning immunoassays entirely in, uh, in protein measurement and diagnostics and related fields, and not immediately, obviously, but begin thinking about uh, using mass spectrometry-based assays instead. And, and I think the reason for this, uh, that one of the most heartening things to me in pursuing this is, is listening to Andy Hoofnagel, because there, there are people who have enough nerve to stand up and say that there are immunoassays that are really bad and are, and are still in clinical use and giving incorrect results because of the lack of complete specificity and the, and the presence of interferences. And this kind of an assay is not susceptible to that class of interferences and, and therefore has the potential for absolute specificity and giving the right answer. So there's a quality argument which is going to be persuasive for a certain number, small number of analytes we're interested in. The next thing is, is the multiplexibility. And the ability to measure hundreds of proteins 
accurately in one run is, is much, much better, particularly when you want to make arguments about cost per test. If we actually need to measure many proteins, it would be better to do it in this kind of a highly multiplexable platform. And, th and the final thing is that it's practical for us to generate these assays pretty cheaply. And by that I mean, you know, ten, twenty thousand dollars to make the reagents to make a robust assay that is actually going to work on a large scale. Whereas to do that for an immunoassay is, is much more difficult and much more time consuming. The rate limiting step is still the rabbit. Rabbits take time to generate antibodies. And in the in the end of the day, we'll have made enough reagents to cover the proteins we're interested in, but currently it's it we have to wait six or nine months to get the reagents that we want to get. And that's that's just unfortunately the way it's going to be. We have a large NCI funded project between the Broad Institute in Boston and the Fred Hutch and the people at UVic and myself to generate 200 of these assays against candidate cancer biomarkers with the objective of going through large series of breast uh, plasmas collected from breast cancer patients to look for potential validation of markers like this. And when we get done with that project in three and a half years, we'll, we'll understand a lot more about how to multiplex these at a high level. But at any rate, we're in, we're in a position to generate the assays. It's also important that, to notice that uh, mass spectrometers, we're using mass spectrometers to measure peptides, which is novel. The peop people have been measuring small molecules like steroid hormones, immunosuppressants, homocysteine, all kinds of metabolites in newborn screening for a long time. Doing the small molecules is what everybody knows how to do with these mass spectrometers, which means that we can measure both proteins and small molecules on the same kind of platform. And that would make a, a major simplification if we were doing all the metabolites and the proteins at the same thing. And so for that reason, I, I, I'm, uh, I would make the prediction that there is there's the, the likelihood and the reason to make a significant investment, and, and we spend a lot of time talking to the NIH to try to make this true, in generating these assays and trying to systematically do a good job of the validation of a large number of candidate biomarkers. Uh, at the end of the day, since we don't have the theory of biomarkers, it is a pure act of faith to believe that there are, are any more biomarkers of disease out there. We, I think we all believe that there have got to be some, because otherwise what's the basis, what's the molecular basis of the disease? And yet, it, it is astonishingly difficult to find them that actually work in a clinical population. And that, that's something that, uh, that means we have to keep working pretty hard to, uh, to overcome that, that unfortunate lack of information. I'll mention two other things that I, I think are going to play the, to the issue of, of how this kind of a, of a technology will, will work in clinical diagnostics in the future. And one of those issues is, is purely uh, sociological connection. The idea of measuring things in patients is the most distal, mo is the most distant from the patient of any of these thing methods we use in, in medicine, I think. Patients don't know what happens to a tube of blood after it's taken out of, out of their arm. They don't know that there's a machine on the other end. Nobody ever sees the machine. Uh, Dade Baring did a study and found out that only 5% of the population knows that in vitro diagnostic means a blood test. People, it, and it therefore, you know, what's out of sight is really out of mind. And, and that, I think, that should change. And the, the, the last thing that's, that's uh, a major barrier for us is the fact that the pharmaceutical industry, which has gotten all the technology and has, has spent all the money in trying to commercialize biology, is 100 times as big as the protein diagnostics business. And that really tells in the, in the emphasis that's placed on, on these activities. And going forward, I, I would argue that, that diagnostics is going to be so much more enabling in terms of, of dealing with the cost structures in medicine even then, than the slow advances in, in uh, drug therapeutics, that it, it, it's going to gradually reverse, not reverse, but gradually going to change that ratio in, in favor of the diagnostics business, a, as it has to if we're going to do what, what amounts to personalized medicine. So from my perspective, the, the opportunities are, are, are pretty interesting and, and profound, uh, as they usually are when you have some kind of a potential revolution, a disruptive evolution in technology. It's, uh, it's, it's not going to take us too long to identify and replace the existing poor immunoassays with mass spec based assays because they're problematical and patients are being ill served by bad diagnostic results. So that, that I think is, is an absolute given. The, the, the potential for multiplexing these, these mass spec assays 
get, really gives a potential reality to the idea of using panel diagnostics. And the, the, the rock curve, the, the specificity and sensitivity measurements for diagnostic tests are, are such that almost any test can be improved by adding a few more analytes that are related to and give additional information about a disease state to get a better specificity and sensitivity. And so panels, if you could do them cheaply, are definitely the right way to do the measurements. And, and a multiplexable analytical system is really the only way that that's ever going to be cost effective. In the regular diagnostics business, I, I've been told that if a panel included up to five proteins, you could imagine making five individual immunoassays. And then at the end of the day, you combine the results and make an index out of it. But if you can measure all five of them at the same time for no incremental cost, that's, that's much better. And, and this kind of uh, approach, I, I believe, or I hope, is going to smooth the path from, uh, from biomarker <laughs> discovery through verification into uh, clinical use uh, in, in an academic setting. Because I, I think that's where a lot of this really sensible biomarker discovery and verification can take place if, in addition to doing the discovery, people in an academic setting are motivated and have the technology to actually go and test it in some thousands of patient samples and see if it's really going to work. That's the, really the standard uh, at which something can be interesting to a, a diagnostics company to make a commercial assay, for example. And the more people that are enabled to do that, the, the better off we're going to be in terms of doing this. So I'd like to conclude by mentioning to you that there are an awful lot of people who have been involved in this. It's a highly collaborative business, particularly the groups up at uh, University of Victoria, both in Terry Pearson's lab at, at UVic and in the uh, uh, UVic Genome BC Proteomics Center. Christy Hunter at Applied Biosystems, the group at Roche uh, Protein Expression who made the first of these polyproteins, and Lee Mikowski at Argonne's making the rest of them, and in particular Mandy and her group in the magnetic bead stuff, and, and Thermo for uh, providing instrumentation on the magnetic bead processing. And I'll finally say there's some papers about this. Thanks very much. Um, I have two questions. One is, one is uh, has to do with the idea of low-hanging fruit. So how do we know, I guess conceptually, what's, what's your way of addressing this question of maybe, maybe the low-hanging fruit or the only fruit? You know, and then, so, but before you answer it, I know you, I know you can say, well, we can, we can, we can do, we can do panels instead of single assays, and we'll get more information that way. But the problem is, that approach has been tried a lot. So, like, for cardiac markers, we've been studying a lot. The best markers are still the ones they got 20 years ago, or whatever, well, not 30 years ago, but basically, the best markers are, are still single markers that go up and, and come down, as opposed to these panels. And so, how do you, how do you address that? And the second thing is, have you considered other ways of enriching pr proteins? So for example, even like a Celex type of thing with this, that's nucleic acid base or, or something else that does, that's not antibody based. It's been coming forever. So the, the, uh, the low hanging fruit question is a really interesting one. So the best markers that I know are the markers that emerge from a tissue if you hit it with a hammer. Mm -hmm. You break the cells. Specific tissue, specific proteins come out, and it works. So MI markers are, are just like that. That's almost too simple you know, to be worth thinking about. That's really straightforward, and it works. Second class are, are tissue-specific functional proteins that are secreted for some reason and, and do some signaling or other functional job. That, and those, those work well, like, like hormones. You know, they, they are, they're very useful biomarkers. And that's the tragedy. That's about as long as the list is of things that you can make a good argument have got to be useful. Now, what, what, what gives me some hope is that there are things which we've discarded a long time ago which can be really useful. CRP is a really good example of that. CRP is a nonspecific acute phase, infection marker, etc. But it's really good as a cardiovascular diagnostic because it turns out inflammation is serious. Well, now in the proteomics business, there's finally enough interest in the acute phase and in inflammation to say to finally somebody <coughs> has never is none of this will ever be published, obviously, went through the lists of biomarkers discovered in lots of different diseases, and acute phase and inflammation proteins show up always in every disease state, just about. And so people say, well, we've got to figure out a way to eliminate those because they're obviously no use. In reality, they may be some of the best biomarkers we've got because they appear to be saying that something is wrong, just we don't know what it is.
And so there, there are, there's, there's a lot of prospect for retreading markers that appear not to be interesting, but we just didn't understand how to use them well enough. And, and I think acute phase is a good example because CRP is extremely variable in its response from person to person. You can get a 100-fold or a 5,000-fold induction given stimulus. But it turns out that if instead you measure 10 or 20 of the high abundance proteins that are acute phase related, but they only change a little bit, but you can measure them accurately. If you put together a panel of those proteins, you can make a, a much more precise measurement, and therefore much more stable over time, measurement of inflammation than you can by measuring CRP. And so I, I think more sophisticated utilization of the potential markers like that will give us ways to use these other proteins. But your, your point is right. There's absolutely no proof that there's anything other than the low-hanging fruit out there. It's, it's very speculative at this point. On, on your second question about uh, using like aptamers, you mean yeah. nucleic acid aptamers instead of antibodies? So uh, if you know Larry Gold, who's done a lot of that aptamer work, he's extremely enthusiastic about everything and every application of this. But even he told me that he didn't think antipeptide aptamers were going to work. And the reason is because they're good at making a surface, but not a groove. And, and what you need to recognize a peptide is a groove. Now, there, can, there are other scaffolds, other protein scaffolds, that may be even better. Some helical bundle things that people, uh, Matthias Pluckton and people like that have worked with, that may be better than antibodies in the long run. But so far, every attempt to use something better than antibodies um, has turned out not to be sufficiently specific.